Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Good morning and welcome to our online service this morning. We are going to worship God and we are so glad that you have decided to join us. Thank you for being with us. The call to worship this morning will be from Psalms 100 and it reads, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Let's pray. Father, it is so good to be in your presence. You are our God and we are your people. You have been so good to us, and we just want to praise and glorify your name. Bless our time together. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Saints of God, come on. Put those hands together. Let's praise him today. Let's praise him. Yes. It's just something about Sunday morning. The wells that I can't on, wait. I can't oh, wait. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. To sing and shout. Sing and shout. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sunday morning, Sunday morning, we gather together, gather church together, in one accord. Hey, said something about Sunday, Sunday morning, said it makes me happy, happy deep inside. Deep well, I thank God for the first step of one of my days. I give it to the Lord and I leave him there. Yes, said it's something about Said it's something about that day, yeah. Said it's gotta be the law. Yeah. I know you get a little worried about your bills sometimes. But Jesus said he'll make a way out of no way. Wow, I don't worry about my bills. Sunday morning, no bill collectors knocking at my door. On Sunday morning, I'll be at church praising the Lord with my mind on Jesus. On Sunday morning, cause everything gonna be alright. I don't worry about my bills getting paid, cause I know that the Lord has already made Something about that day, it is gonna be the law. I got one more thing I want to tell you. Y'all ain't gonna believe this now. Listen, some folks don't go to church on Sunday morning. Some stay at home. Some even go fishing. Oh, they don't know. On Sunday morning, they just don't know. Just what they're missing. She's wrong. Sunday morning, Sunday morning with all power in his hand. But one day he's coming back again. Tell me, tell me now who said he ain't staying in something about the day. Said it must be the law. Something about, something about Sunday morning, something about Sunday morning, 
makes me feel good inside. Makes me feel so good deep inside. I ain't talking about money. I ain't talking about Tuesday. I ain't talking about Wednesday. I ain't talking about Thursday. Not Friday. Not Saturday. Oh, Sunday morning. Oh, Sunday morning. Jesus rose on Sunday morning. Power in his hand. Oh, Lord, deep inside. See, when I think about all the things the Lord has done for me, he's talking to me. Somebody that died, Would you pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you for another day of life, a day of beauty, a day of blessing. Father, we know that all that we have, all that we are, all that we're going to be comes from you. Thank you for blessing us so fully, so richly. You have supplied our every need. Father, you've supplied for our physical needs. You have given us air and water and food and clothing and shelter. Father, you surrounded us with loved ones and people to support us, to fight with us. Father, we ask you to bless us, to protect us from the evil one. Father, you've also given us everything we need for life, for spiritual life through Christ. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for the hope that we have in him. Father, you've given us promises that continues to sustain us as we go along this journey. Father, we thank you for each one. They give us hope. They keep us going. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have surrounded us with brothers and sisters in Christ to support us, to strengthen us, to keep us going strong. Father, thank you for the way that you have designed the church with Christ as the head and we as the body. Father, we thank you for the strength that we gain through working together, through our fellowship, through our unity. Thank you for the love and the comfort we receive from serving and supporting one another. Father, we know you know all of our struggles. You know what each one of us needs. Father, help us with our faith. Help us to trust in you to solve our problems. Father, we pray for the continued relief of the victims of the virus. Father, we pray that you would be with each one who's been affected. Father, we pray that you would comfort those who've lost loved ones. Father, we pray that you would heal those who have become ill. Father, we know that many have lost their jobs, many are struggling financially. Father, supply for their needs. Father, we pray for those that continue to be on the front line, for the doctors and the nurses and the police officers and the first responders. And Father, protect them and be with them. Father, we pray for this congregation that we will remain strong. Father, help us to concentrate on unity and on doing things together and being together. Father, we ask that you would bless the leadership, that you would bless the board, that you would bless each family. Father, we know that um, you're the great physician. We ask you to heal our sick. Father, we know that you are strength for the weak, and we ask you to strengthen those who are struggling. Father, we know that you have given us a way of escape with every temptation. We pray that you would help us to see it. Father, we know that you forgive as we forgive others. Help us to be a forgiving people. Father, we once again want to say that we know everything comes from you, and we're so blessed 
to have this opportunity to come before you in prayer. Father, continue with us, continue to bless us, continue to protect us, continue to lead us. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. As we partake of the cup and the bread, yeah. we do remember, remember the blood Jesus shed. shed. And this Jesus said to the, to the twelve, earnestly, for this you do, this you do in remembrance of me. Please do this in memory of what I did for thee. Please do this in memory plus the Calvary. There were thorns on his head, can't you feel the nails in my sins? Our Jesus hung on that old rugged cross for the sin of every man. He was a he was talked about when they pierced my Savior in his side. He shed his blood for and for you and me he died. Oh, this in memory of what yeah. I did for thee. So why don't you do this in memory of bloodstained so won't you eat of my flesh, drink of my shed blood, I do this in memory of my dear Jesus' blood. Every time I think of my love, there is no doubt that you really love died for me. We now have the opportunity to gather around the Lord's table to remember the gift of our Lord and Savior, to honor Him in communion. I'm going to be reading from Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning in the 14th verse. And it reads, When the hour had come, He sat down and the twelve apostles with Him. Then He said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful to have this opportunity to honor our Lord and Savior, to remember what he went through for our sake. Father, we're so thankful for him. We're so thankful for the fact that he loved us enough to go to the cross for us. Father, we want to thank you for the body that was given for us, for the blood that was shed. 
As we partake of this bread, help us to see his body on the cross. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to see the blood of the new covenant that washes away our sins. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. We now have the opportunity to give back to God some of what he has entrusted us with. I'm going to be reading from Matthew, the sixth chapter, beginning in the 19th verse. And it reads, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. And in verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and riches. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity that we have to give back. Father, we want to be generous. We want to be the kind of givers that you have intended for us to be. Father, help us to read and study so that we might have your attitude about giving. Father, help us to be generous. Father, we pray that you will bless the offering this morning. Father, we want to do with it as you would have us to do. Father, we pray that you would bless it. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. There are three ways that you can give. The first way is to go to our website, holgatecfc.com hit the donate tab and you can put your information in there. The second way is through the mail. You can mail your check to Holgate Street Church of Christ, P.O. Box 18226, Seattle, Washington, 98118. The third way is through the Zelle app, where you can send your contribution to treasure at holgatecoc.com. Thank you and may God bless you. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God, glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God.
Good morning, Holgate. How's everyone doing? It is a pleasure to be back with you again uh, this Sunday morning. Now, I know some of you might not recognize me because I finally got my hair cut. Um, it's been, I think it was 12 weeks uh, here in the Seattle area that we were on lockdown and businesses were closed. And uh, man, what a trying time. But uh, I'm back. I'm cut up. I'm feeling fresh this morning. And I trust you all are staying safe. Um, it's just good to be with you today. And it's good to be able to share this message that I'm excited to present to you uh, on this occasion. Uh, in the vein of the messages that, that Jimmy has been sharing with us over the last few weeks about uh, bias, discrimination, uh, and the Bible, uh, this morning I'd like to continue somewhat in that vein as we are thinking about what's been happening in our country over the last seven weeks and how we can think uh, biblically and theologically about these things and be ready to respond uh, in a way that not only honors our God, but also meets the needs um, of what we are seeing currently in society. So having said that, uh, I invite you quickly to join me over at the 22nd chapter of the book of Matthew. And I will begin reading at verse number 34, Matthew chapter 22. And verse number 34, I'll be reading from the English Standard Translation. Your translation might read a little differently, but it is the word of God all the same. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher... Which is the great commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. <clears throat> Family, it's been seven weeks approximately since we witnessed on camera the murder of George Floyd. That murder threw uh, this nation into uh, prolonged civil unrest, that is, and protest that has and is continuing even to this day, although it is getting um, less and less attention in the media, it's still going on. Discussions are ongoing about what's the next step and how can we fix and repair that which is broken in American society. My contribution today in this sermonic presentation is to get us to think about specifically what I deem are a few statements that we hear that I believe sometimes are misused and misapplied in relation to some of the things that we have seen and are continuing to see in our society. These statements are used to almost in a dog whistle type of way control and show overwhelming force and dominance, law and order. It's a phrase that's thrown around. Rule of law, law of order. And I want us to think about these phrases this morning as it relates to what you and I have been seeing over the last seven weeks. These are terms that we hear often. And we usually hear these terms by those who are in power, those who write the laws, and they are also tasked with maintaining order. And that right there should make you suspicious from the word go 
about these phrases. Law and order, the rule of law, spoken by those who write the laws, spoken by those who set the laws, and spoken by those who are tasked with enforcing the laws. Law and order, who made the laws? And who defines what is order and what is out of order? Now, the term law and order has a very storied history, and it's not a good history. I don't have time to go through it today, but if you're interested in this term law and order and how it's been applied negatively, particularly for communities of color, I invite you to check out the documentary 13th. You will see in this documentary how this term law and order has been weaponized to specifically denote the policing and the controlling of the movements and the thoughts and the action of people of color, specifically black people. So I'm, I'm suspicious. That's history. So I'm suspicious now when I hear the terms law and order. I'm suspicious now when I hear even our current president state that he is the president of law and order, considering the history that is tied to that term. Rule of law is another term. Rule of law is another term that has racial undertones. Again, commonly used by those that are in power, but it's rarely applied to the mindsets and the actions that put those people in power. Did you catch what I said? People say they believe in rule of law, but they don't apply rule of law to the very mindsets and actions that gave them the power that they have to say rule of law. So when America was founded, my question is, did it break any rules? Did America break any rules when it was founded? When the people who established this country as we know it today, when they came here and there were people that were already here, did they respect the rule of the law of the people that were here when they got here? Again, I'm suspicious. When rule of law is applied to everyone else, but it's not equally applied to those who are throwing those terms around. The natives of this land that were robbed of their lives and robbed of their land, I want to know, did rule of law apply to them? What about the rule of law in England? Concerning the colonies that were here before they became states. The process of those colonies separating themselves from England to become independent, which we just celebrated here recently, was rule of law involved? Or did people become rebellious against rule of law? The same rebellion that we hear criticized today in 2020. Why am I sharing all this with you this morning? Because theologically, I want us to begin to question today human laws. I want us to begin to question the laws that man has put into law, that has signed into law, devised them, has written them, someone saying signed, sealed, and delivered. And historically, unfortunately, in Christianity, we have felt resistant to question human laws because a lot of times people just kind of quote to us, obey the laws of the land. How many of us have heard that? You got to obey the laws of the land. Obey the laws of the land. So as I come to you this morning, as a preacher, trying to get you to think about laws and who made the laws and are the laws moral or are they immoral? In the back of all of our heads, we're reciting what they told us ever since we were small. Obey the laws of the land. But see, what we didn't do as the church, we failed to give the church a theological framework to understand what it means to obey the laws of the land. It's much more complex than just quoting that text, which, by the way, is found in Romans chapter 13. So let's run over to Romans chapter 13 quickly. Let's read this text. And then I, I would like to critique how we often hear this text used to buttress current laws, many of them which themselves and even previous laws which have been immoral. 
Romans chapter 13, starting with verse number one. Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Verse two, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Paul continues, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So this is what we've heard a lot of times as it's related to human laws. You have to obey the laws of the land, be subject to them. The first thing I want to say about this text is that this is a very general, this is a very general teaching about the place of government in society. And when I say government here, I'm talking about law and order. Paul is giving a very general statement about the appropriate place of government in society, and that is to maintain law and order. This text is not an endorsement of everything that government does. In fact, this text cannot be that. I'll show you that in just a second. Understand what this text is, though. What it's not, it's not an endorsement of what every government does. I know that because governments are at odds, one with another. One government does this, another government does that. But Romans 13 says, obey the laws of the land or be subject what if you have two different sets of government that are telling their subjects to do different things? So it, 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 it's, it's, it's faulty logic here to take this and apply this to everything that one particular government does. Understand this, that government can be, has been, and even to this day can be as much of an evildoer as the people in Romans, Romans 13 that Paul says government has been sent to punish. Did you notice that? In Romans 13, Paul says, if you're an evildoer, you need to be afraid because government will punish you. But you need to also know that government has, is, and will always be itself also an evildoer. Government has done evil. Government has perpetrated evil. As a matter of fact, a sad fact in history, if you go back and you look at how many people in history have died at the hands of their own government, not somebody else's government, not another government that they were at war with. How many people in the history of the world has died, have died at the hands of their own government, much less another government? So we need, we need to take government off of its high horses. It's not infallible. It does and can and will continue to be a promoter of evil in the world. To such extent Godly people should question themselves about the rules that government sets in place. Paul says in verse three, rulers are a terror to those of good conduct, not to bad. That's not always true. It's a general statement. It is a general in its generality. It's true that if you do wrong, government will be there to punish you. But I can give you a whole lot of examples where people have not done wrong and government has been there to punish them. That's the problem with taking Romans 13 and trying to apply it to everything that government does. Sometimes government is a terror to those who do good, not just to those who do evil. And so you and I need to think through the laws that are in our land and not just quote Romans 13. And I have no greater example for you than that of the Apostle Paul himself, the one who wrote the text that we're reading right now, the text that we are dealing with right now. I can just take Paul's life and show you that government many times is a perpetrator of evil. Now, how did Paul die? 
You don't find anything about Paul's death in the scriptures. You have to close the Bible and open the history books to find out how Paul died. Paul died being beheaded. He was beheaded. Who beheaded the apostle Paul? The government. What government? The government under which he lived. Wait a minute. So you mean to tell me that in Romans 13, Paul tells the Romans who were in Rome, the government that was in charge at the time, Paul tells the Romans to be subject to their government and that the government is there to take care of the evildoers, but it's that very same government that ends up putting Paul in prison and then executing him. Was that government doing that with God's approval? Now, I understand everything happens with the approval of God, but what I'm trying to say is that was not a good and honorable thing. That was government being a terror to someone who was good, who was the Apostle Paul. So just within the life of the Apostle Paul, we see if you take Romans 13 and you misapply this text, you have Paul basically sanctioning what Rome did to him when they took his life away. You have basically Nero, who was the emperor at the time of the execution of the Apostle Paul being the good guy. And you have Paul being the bad guy because Paul was put to death by the government. And if the government always is a terror to those who do evil, I don't think so. It's a general statement. And there are a whole lot of exceptions that can be seen even outside of the life of Paul. Romans 13 is not a stamp of approval on everything that the government does. And so within, our, within the current context that we are finding ourselves today in America, 2020, protesting is not condemned in Romans 13. I have heard people take Romans 13 and try to condemn those who are protesting. You, I do not see any interpretative, interpretative model of Romans 13, Romans 13 that condemns Protesting. Watch this now. Protesting is not illegal in the United States of America. In fact, protesting is protected by the Constitution of the United States. Now, the government can regulate how you protest, when you protest, but they cannot regulate your ability, your right to protest. So if Romans 13 is about obeying the laws of the land, then how can protesting be wrong if it's not only legal, but protected by the very laws that are in the land? Oh, well, what about them? They out there looting. See, you only bring up looting because you don't want to deal with why people are protesting. I don't I don't see anybody on TV advocating looting. Those of us that that, that have a cause to plead those of us that have a dog in this fight. But it's very easy to bring up looting to distract attention from why people are protesting. And you have a very difficult case to take Romans 13 and try to say that someone is doing something that is unbiblical when the very laws of the land that Romans 13 is used to buttress allow for peaceful protest. But in the Constitution, the Constitution, which is a very imperfect document in itself, but it protects the rights of those who want to protest. So how can protesting be wrong when it's legally protected? Now, naturally, those who make the laws don't want to see protesters. And that's what I want you to think about this morning. See, those who make the laws and those who enforce the laws Many of them are the ones that have problem with protesters because the protesting is asking them to look at the laws and look at their enforcement of the laws, that there is not equity. Paul, the Apostle Paul himself, was one that utilized what was legally available to him at his disposal for the furtherance of equity and justice. I'm going to repeat that so you can understand what I'm saying, and then I'm going to show it to you in the scriptures. Paul, the Apostle Paul himself, the one that people ostensibly use to speak against 
social justice based upon Romans 13, Paul, it was not below him to utilize rights he had at his disposal for the furtherance of equity and justice. Notice this in Acts 20, 25, Acts chapter 25, verses 6 through 12. I'm going to show you an instance where the Apostle Paul utilizes the law for his own personal benefit. He uses a right that the government told him he had. He exercised that right. Acts 25 and verse 6. The Bible says after he stayed among them, not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, in the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. So Paul is standing before a Roman magistrate. He has false accusers around him. They had come from Jerusalem to give this false testimony about Paul before the Roman magistrate, whose name was Festus. Verse 8, Paul argued in his defense. He said, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, Paul says, wishing to do the Jews a favor, Festus said this, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried on those charges there? Let me set the scene for you. You got Festus, who is the Roman magistrate. You got Paul, who is in judgment. And you have the Jews who came from Jerusalem to give false testimony. Now, Festus wanted to do the Jews a favor. And the Romans always wanted to maintain a good relationship with the Jews who they were controlling because they always feared revolt. So anything that they could do to stay in the good graces of the people that they were governing, they would do that. So Festus knows if he turns Paul over to the Jews, it would make them happy because they would do with Paul what they wanted. So Festus asks Paul, do you want to go to Jerusalem? Well, Paul knows that that's not going to be good for him. So here's Paul's response. Paul says in verse 10, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. Paul says, I've done no wrong to the Jews. Festus, you know this very well. If I am a wrongdoer and if I've done anything worthy of death, Paul says, then I'm not trying to escape death. But Paul says this, if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. What did, what did Paul do? Only a Roman citizen could appeal to Caesar. Paul utilizes something that was at his disposal that the government told him he had a right to to say, no, I'm not going to let this injustice go down without a fight. I'm not going to Jerusalem and I want to take my justice from this court. That seems like a court that is not fair and balanced to another court. Now, we know the end of the story, but. The point I'm trying to make here is that Paul utilized his right that the government gave him in the furtherance of equity and justice. Paul used his Roman citizenship, a right that the government told him he had that was legally due him. I'm also reminded in 1 Corinthians 7 that Paul basically tells those who are slaves, if you have a chance to get free, Baby, you better take it. <laughs> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul says, were you a bond servant? So in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is basically making the point. Look, however God called you, whatever you were when God called you, you can stay that way when God called you. You don't have to change your physical state in life when God calls you to be pleasing to God. So if God calls you and you're single, you can stay single. If God calls you and you are married, you can stay married. If God calls you, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 21, if God calls you and you are a bond servant when God calls you, Paul says, don't worry about it. You can still be under bondage when God calls you and still be pleasing. But then he adds on. He adds on this phrase. He says, but. 
if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. That's in the Bible. If you can get free, get free. If you can't, it's OK, because your physical state in life does not affect the spiritual state that you have with God when God calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, the point I'm trying to make is that Paul had no problem with Christians advancing their cause to make their lives better in the world in which they live whether it's a slave becoming free or whether it's a Roman citizen using his citizenship to get fair and equitable trial in society. So the underlying point I'm trying to make today, brothers and sisters, is that human law is flawed. Human law is flawed. You need to understand that and you need to remember that when we hear terms like law and order and rule of law that human law is flawed. And you and I, as children of God, need to look critically at the laws that have been set before us and ask ourselves some very serious questions about the morality of the laws that are in place today. Let's take a quick look, both historically and in the current day, at how flawed our laws are right here in these United States of America. What is, I'm told the greatest country that ever was. I'm told that there's been no country like it. I'm told it's the greatest thing since before there was sliced bread. So let's take a moment and look at the laws that have existed in this country. And I just want to show you how flawed and how ungodly they have been. To further my case this morning about you got to be very careful about these terms, law and order and rule of law. 1896. Do you know what happened in 1896? In 1896, there was a case before the Supreme Court of the United States. That case is titled Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy is for Homer Plessy, who was what we call an octoroon. An octoroon was someone that had one eighth blood that was non-white. Someone that was seventh eighth white, but one eighth non white. They were called octoroons and they were considered they were considered black. Mr. Plessy one day gets on a train in my home state of Louisiana and he sits in the white car because there were white cars and there were black cars. But Mr. Plessy is an octoroon. He is one eighth black. So he is not allowed, according to the laws of the land at that time, to sit in the white car. He is arrested. He takes his case before the court. He is denied justice. He appeals and takes his case all the way to the top of the court, the top court in the land. And do you know what the top court in the land said? The top court in the land, this land, that I'm told is great, said separate public facilities for the racist, separate facilities are constitutional as long as they are what? Equal. And that's where we got the term separate but equal. It came from this court case in 1896. But I'm not done. The same group, not the same group of people, but the same group, the Supreme Court, looked at the same document, the Constitution of the United States, and some 60 odd years later, in 1954, the same group looked at the same document and said, separate but equal is unconstitutional. And one old black man said, the good Lord done spoke from heaven. Of course, I was not around during this time. But this was a monumental case. But what I want you to see today is that in 1896, a group looked at a document and said one thing. In 1954, the same group looked at the same document. And not only did they say something different, they said something completely opposite. 
It's one thing to say something different. It's totally different to say something that's completely opposite of what you said just 60 years ago. Same document. Same Supreme Court. So was the law right and moral in 1896 or did the law become right and moral in 1954? And those 60 some odd years where people, black people, were advocating, not to mention that there was really no equality. I mean, that's I, that. But I digress. <laughs> it was separate but equal, but we know that it was never equal. But those 60 some odd years that people fought for an equitable position. Do you mean to tell me that they were wrong because the law of the land upheld separate but equal? And then you throw Romans 13 behind that to give it credence? Did God change his mind in 1954? Did God believe one thing in 1953? And then did God believe another thing in 1954? All because a group looked at the same document and came up with a different conclusion. Not only that, when you talk about the rule of law. So the rule of law in 1954 was that separate but equal was unconstitutional. Question, were they quick in executing that rule of law? Those southern states, were well, they walking around talking about where well, the law has changed? I, I guess we're going to have to integrate now because that's what the law says, which is what we hear today so much about rule of law. But when the law changed in 1954, let me tell you, they were not quick to execute that law. My own father was born in the Deep South in 1953. So the very year after he was born, the law of the land was that separate but equal is unconstitutional and that the races must be integrated so that equity can be assured. So you would think that if that law came down one year after my father was born, that my father would have grown up in integrated schools. You would think that, right? Because they believed in the rule of law. <clears throat> <clears throat> that was not the case. In fact, from 1954, which is when this case came down, my father was one year old, all the way to 1971 his senior year in high school, that was the year they were forced to integrate. Don't talk to me about rule of law. You don't believe in the rule of law. You believe in the rule of law when it suits you. That's the history of this country. But the history of this country is they will fight rule of law when they don't like what the law says. 17 years and you still gotta be forced? Again, family, this is why these, these phrases, even today, they irritate me because we hear this, but the history of our country shows us that they don't truly believe it. Our country does not even believe it, has not practiced it, and even the ones that we hear from even today. They did not immediately comply. They resisted. They rebelled. Oh, and by the way, a lot of them that resisted and rebelled, they also went to church on Sunday. Uh-huh. They went to church on Sunday, but then they resisted and rebelled the rule of law that had come down from the Supreme Court. So you could miss me with rule of law. Because this country has not practiced it. OK, 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 let's move a little closer. Let's move a little closer to our current situation. I want to talk to you for a moment about Washington State. I want to talk to you about Washington State. Now, December the 6th, 2012. Do you know what happened on December the 6th, 2012? Some of y'all know, even though you're not going to admit you know. But on December the 6th, 2012, recreational use of marijuana was legalized in Washington State. The first state to do so. Wait a minute. OK, December the 6th, 2012 is legal. But December the 5th, 2012 is illegal. So if you did it on December the 5th, you're a lawbreaker. 
But if you did it on December the 6th, you're honorable. If you sold it on December the 5th, they will put you in jail. But on December the 6th, they'll give it a new name called cannabis. We won't even call it weed no more. We got a respectable name. We call it the cannabis industry. It's on the stock market. And now you can make loads of money doing something that on December the 5th, they would have put you in jail for. Question. All of the black and brown bodies that have been put in jail before December the 6th, 2012, did they release them? Once they said that selling weed and doing weed was honorable and legal, did they go back and release those that they had put in jail? But all because somebody got somewhere and signed a sheet of paper, now it's an honorable way to make a living. And who's getting rich off of cannabis today in our state? Is it the black and brown bodies? I'm asking so many questions that y'all know the answers to already. This is why I have hesitations about the rule of law, because the people who make the laws make them to benefit themselves and to keep others in bondage, physically, literally incarcerated. Because if it's honorable now, it was honorable 24 hours before then. I'm not mad this morning. But it upsets me that we hear these phrases and that we feel compelled to fall in line with the rule of law and law and order. And here we have all these blaring, these, these, these uh, examples, blaring examples in our face. I got one more for one more, one more for you. In our current situation, let's move into this current situation and let's talk about face coverings. Now, you would you would have thought it, it, it is really amazing to see how people are rebelling over face coverings. Right. Face covering. Put a mask on. We are in a pandemic. And we have people that are arguing about putting a mask on. It's embarrassing. And most of those, a lot of those who are doing the arguing today about putting a mask on, they go to church on Sundays. That bothers me. I got a problem with that. They go to church on Sundays. They don't, they don't go to the mosque on Sundays. They don't go to the temple. They go to church. They, they call themselves Christ followers. But you ask them to put on a mask for public health, and they about lose their minds. Yet, yet, we don't hear law and order when it comes to face masks. Very interesting. We don't hear people talking about obey the, the, the laws of the land and rule of law when it comes to face masks. Hmm. But when it's about controlling and surveilling minorities, you got a lot to say about the rule of law. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you that it, even in 2020, those who say rule of law do not truly believe in rule of law. Watch this clip. Watch this clip right now that I'm going to show you, and then I'll come back and talk about it. I am not the mask police. I am not going to enforce any mask wearing. That is not my responsibility. That is not my job. People should be able to make that choices themselves. All right, family, did you did you see that? Did you hear that? He said, I am not the mask police. Wait a minute. You all police everything else. You police busted taillights. You police jaywalking. You police, is this the correct, is this the correct address on your driver's license? You police that. The police police a whole lot of things, folks, that have nothing to do with public safety. But it comes now down to wearing a mask and we have a law enforcement official who says, I'm not going to enforce the law. Does he get the right to say that? Does he have the right to decide which laws he's going to enforce and which laws he's not going to enforce? What about law and order? 
What about the rule of law? Somebody said, well, I just think the rule, I just think face masks are illegal. You don't get the right to decide what's legal and not legal. There is a legal process that you can take someone to court and you can let the judicial branch decide whether the legislative or executive branch has overrun their bounds. You don't sit at home in your armchair and decide that law, I don't like it, I'm not going to obey it. Can I do that? Can I just sit at home and say, you know what, I just think I'm going to speed and I just think speeding is okay. See, but, but, but people feel very comfortable looking at laws and saying, I like that law, I like that law, I like that law because it doesn't affect me, it doesn't police me, it doesn't control me. But in all these other laws that I don't like, I'm going to discard those. Then you don't believe in the rule of law. You believe in the rule of your own imagination. You think that you are the law. The rule of law matters the most when it's laws that you don't like, but you submit yourselves to them because you, will so, but you, you supposedly believe in the rule of law. You supposedly believe in law and order. So people should be able to make that choice themselves. I cannot believe a police officer said that because they don't say that about all the other things. Black people have lost their lives over busted taillights that have nothing to do with public safety. But you police that, but you won't police this. We know the reason why it's political. Mask wearing has become a political item in our country. That's beside the point. I'm just trying to show you all of these people that parade around saying law and order and rule of law. They don't believe it. They don't believe it and they don't practice it. Do you not know that I can commit a crime and you can commit a crime? But if I know a governor or a president that I can get pardon of that crime and you stay in jail for that same crime, I'm just asking you, does that seem fair to you? That's all I'm trying to say. Let's take a real slow, long look at how we view, how we view rather, the laws under which we live. Let me hasten to my conclusion because I do want to get to my text today. And the thought that I'd like to leave us with as we think about laws and as we think about order. Now, the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. Once they saw that Jesus had quieted the mouths of the Sadducees, they thought it was their turn to get him. And so a lawyer asks Jesus, he says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Of all the laws that are out there, Jesus, what is the greatest law? That's a great question. And even today in the church, so many of us just think all the laws are the same. Uh, anything will send you to hell. Uh, a lie will send you to hell, just like anything else. Well, technically, you, you are right, but all the laws are not the same. They don't all have the same weight. Some laws are weightier than others. Some laws are more important than others. And I'm so glad that Jesus took the time here in Matthew 22 to help us understand what was important to him and his God, because what was important to him and his God should be important to us. If we are following the same God. Jesus said. You will love the Lord, your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. It does not get any better, any higher than this loving your creator. It doesn't get any better than that. And, and later on, I'll have time to just to just perch out right here and give, give message, give a message, give messages on why this is the most important thing that you and I could ever do in our life is to love our creator, is to love our God. And we got to love him more than we love anything. That's all. It gets your emotions. It gets your intellect. It, it is all encompassing. But the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love God is the greatest. Next is love your neighbor. Don't talk to me about country. Don't talk to me about church. Don't talk to me about any of these things that we put before these two things right here. These are still the greatest. You start with loving God and you start as someone has said, that's the vertical relationship. And then you start with loving your neighbor. And that's the horizontal relationship. And in another text that I don't have time to go to, Jesus lets us know who our neighbor is. Right. Who is our neighbor? Luke 15, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Your neighbor is that person that you see along the way that needs your time, attention, help, assistance. Your neighbor is anyone that you come in contact with. So that's a tall task, loving God and then extending out and loving others. So what I learned, what I learned, family, this is how it applies today. When you talk about law and order and we talk about the rule of law, let, let's let these laws rule now. So if I love my neighbor as myself, watch this now. If I love my neighbor as myself, then I won't put my knee on my neighbor's neck for eight minutes after he's been handcuffed. Praise God. I won't do that. I won't do that. Why won't I do that? Because I love my neighbor as myself. So I wouldn't want that done to me. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to someone else. If, if I love my neighbor as myself, I won't shoot first and ask questions later. Why? Because I don't I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that done to me. If if I love my neighbor as myself, then I'm not going to you know, put a little white lie on the police report so it'll be believable to the judge so I can get a warrant. Mm -mm. Wouldn't do that because because I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't want that done to myself. See, see, if I love my neighbor as myself, then you know what? I'm not going to sit idly. I'm not going to stand in silence as I watch other people suffer injustice. I wouldn't do that. Why? Because I wouldn't want that done for me. So, so as an African-American, uh, I, I have to stand when I see other groups who are oppressed. Why? Because I want other groups to stand with me because that's what I do for my neighbor because that's what I've done for me. And so even in this country now, right now, right now in this country, right now in this country, we have the leader of this country that is using a racial slur against Asian Americans to talk about the coronavirus right now in 2020, not Plessy versus Ferguson, not 1954. Right now, I, I stand against it. And to me, that is an extension of the second greatest commandment, which is love your neighbor as yourself, because because if a racial slur was used against me and my people, I would want an ally or an advocate to stand next to me. Right. So when I see it done to others, I need to be willing and ready to stand next to them because that's what you do for your neighbor. So when I see when I see my neighbor's kids in cages at the border, when I see people that are fleeing political unrest and violence just because they want to live, they want to breathe in this world. I cannot sit and stand by and not say anything because that's not what a neighbor does. Because I that's not what I want. That's not what I want done for me. And Jesus said, everything in the law and the prophets rest on these two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. That comes before country. It comes before patriotism. It comes before anything else. And I tell you what, that's some law and order that I can embrace. You want to know why? Number one, because it's God's law. And number two, it's in the right order. We start there. We run everything that we hear about law and order. We run it through those two laws right there. You and I will be better equipped to be able to discern the difference between that which is good and that which is evil. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this message that you deposited into me that I can now release to my family. And I pray that they will receive it in the same spirit that I give it, which is love. Thank you for 
the greatest commandment of loving you. And we see that great love on display in the life and ministry of Jesus, who left all that he had, came down and lived among us, died so that we could one day be with you forever. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for loving us and help us as your children as we move through 2020 with so many challenging things that we are seeing and hearing, things that are testing our faith, things that are testing our understanding of ourselves and the world in which we live, things that are testing our understanding of the scriptures. Help us to hold fast to your unchanging hand. And Father, you, we know that you will never leave us and that you will never forsake us. And that you will, by and by, receive all the honor and all the glory, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. We want to remind you that at 5 o'clock today, 5 o'clock, we're going to be online live, taking your prayer requests and also giving you an opportunity uh, to share words of encouragement. So the link is on the website, holgatecoc.com, and I hope you'll join us. Also at 1215, Kids, kids Talk. Kids Talk is at 1215. Again, the link is on the website. I hope you'll be there. Worry about your feel sometimes. On, but man. Jesus said he'll make a way out of no way. Wow, I don't worry about my bills. Don't worry. Sunday morning, Sunday morning. No, bill no bill collectors knocking at my door. Oh, oh, if they come, they come. On, Sunday morning, on Sunday morning, I'll be at church yeah. praising the Lord oh, with my oh, mind oh, on oh, Jesus. Jesus. Sunday morning, Sunday morning, everything. Everything.